Okay, we can start? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do about 45 minute talk, and then following the 45 minute talk, we have some, the three C's. And the three C's are questions, comments, and complaints. <laughs> yeah, I know questions doesn't start with a C, but it's good enough. Hi, welcome. We have a venerable monk here. Okay, yes. Welcome. No, you're just in time. Unfortunately, you missed three wonderful jokes. <laughs> but you can hear them afterwards. So, the topic of the talk is the 16 steps of Anapanasati. Of this is the mindfulness of breathing. We did advertise that subject for the talk, but I hope I'm not going to make it too intellectual. I hope that uh, what I say can also have something of interest for those people who don't meditate regularly. But just to check, can you please put your hand up if you meditate regularly? Oh, wow. Oh, you do. So you don't meditate regularly. <laughs> <laughs> Nor do you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, it's a good to also talk, not just general talks, but specific talks. So, with these 16 stages of Anapana Sati, Anapana Sati means mindfulness along with the breathing. And it was one of the most common forms of meditation which the Buddha taught. And he also would be in encouraging it so much. And it was the meditation which I did a lot of, not just now, but when I was young, throughout my life, Anapana Sati, meditation on the breath became one of the easiest of meditations to do. And even to the point that, uh, you know, I did my degree at Cambridge, and I was in theoretical physics, and it was supposed to be tough. But the natural sciences tripos, which was, it was part of, they always, uh, it was a tough um, exam, in those days, they called it final exams. Because in those exams, you either passed or you failed, and everything else you'd done for three years counted for nothing. It was all down to those last series of exams. And I always thought that it was important to do well. So like many other people, I was also anxious. And I often say, if only I had known I was going to become a monk, <laughs> I wouldn't have worried so much. But at least at that time, I knew how to meditate. This was one of the first times I discovered the use of meditation, like meditation on the breath, on to make it easy to do those exams. Because what happened, there was a three-hour paper in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, for six days straight. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and even Saturday as well. It was very tough. But for me, the hour which we had for lunch, I never had any lunch at all. Instead, I went back to my room, and as I was in my room, I sat down on a seat, and just meditated for half an hour. But when you're meditating for half an hour on the middle of your final exams, you can imagine what came into my mind immediately I closed my eyes. It was the morning exam. Did I answer those co questions correctly? Could I have added more explanation? And of course, you know, we always say that to be mindful, you have to be in the present moment. And if you're in the past, you know, you're not paying attention to what's happening now. And it's easy to say, but how many of you can do that? And so for me anyway, I practiced enough by that time that I could let go of the past pretty easily. It was obvious that the morning examination paper was in. I couldn't change it now. Good, bad, it was done. So I could let go of thinking about the examination which I'd just done 
which I could not change. And the next thing which came into my mind was the afternoon exam. Should I get up from my seat, open my books, and do some last minute revision? And even though I know, I've said this many times, and people agree with me, whatever you look at, try and swat up before the exam, never ever comes up in the paper, never. <laughs> and it was more important that I looked after my mind right now. It was tired. So I stopped thinking about the future exam, which I didn't know what was going to happen at all, and came into this present moment. And of course, very often I say that your future is always being made now. If you really want to do something for your future and be successful, happy, relaxed, please stay in this moment. That's the best way to prepare for a good, happy future. And for me, once I let go of the future, worry about an exam which was coming up you know, in about half an hour, then and it was going to change my life. If I passed, failed, it was important. It didn't change my life at all. Don't worry about the future. The future is, works out totally unexpected. If you ask me, I've been a monk 48 years now, if you'd have asked me when I ordained as a monk in Thailand where I would be in 48 years, giving a talk in Oxford would be the last thing which I'd have suggested. Your future is a series of totally unexpected events. And I love that type of future, I must admit. I get all these really interesting invitations. Please, I apologize if I can't accept so many invitations which you give. But one of the best invitations which I got was to give the keynote address at a big conference in South Korea, in Daejeon. Yeah, the conference was the 2019 World Computer Congress. I don't know much about computers. <laughs> but that won't stop me. <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so I got this invitation and I accepted it. And I accepted it on the grounds that I do recall the story of, uh, it happened in the St. Louis World's Fair, I think it was about 1910 or something. It just so happened at a World's Fair in St. Louis, United States, that they had to have you know, the food and the food store for everybody. And the man who got the concession for selling ice cream, was his store was right next door, right next to the store selling waffles. You know waffles? You have it sometimes instead of pancakes or waffles. So the two of them were selling their different types of food day after day after day at this World's Fair. And then what happened was they talked to one another, they became friends, and they decided, can't we kind of collaborate? And from that, we got the invention of the ice cream cone. That's true, it's not a joke. <laughs> Two totally different food types, they managed to combine to get a much better food type and much more popular than the individual ones. And so I thought, well, you know, Buddhist and meditation and computers and internet. <laughs> there must be some combination there somewhere. Who knows? But anyway, I went there. The, I gave the keynote address. And that was a wonderful experience, simply because I admitted I don't know much about computers. But I know so much more about other parts of the intellectual pursuits of truth and breakthroughs. And this is one of the things which I've taught so many of you this before. I'll, talk, I'll teach it so quickly. How heavy is my glass of water? And the answer is, the longer you hold it, the heavier it feels. That's seeing the problem in a different way. Once it gets too heavy, you find your intellectual output gets stuffed up. You can't think straight, you can't find the words, you can't find the solutions, you're dull. So what should you do when this 
water gets too heavy to hold comfortably, or let's say another word, too heavy to hold productively. Simple, you just put it down. You let it go and rest for a while. And after five minutes or ten minutes, I'm going to rush this, you pick it up again, it actually feels lighter. You can carry it easily with more productivity. And that's the sort of the story, they liked that story. Not, so, not only liked it, it found its way into Harvard Business School, where it's now called a investment in time. They had to, you know, to put it in some sort of words, which makes it acceptable to Harvard Business School. So, in investment of time, you spend half an hour relaxing your mind in meditation. That's a half an hour when you're not productive. But after you do that, you find your mind is clear. You can actually write whatever you need to say, finding the words and the sentence structure beautifully, and you're much more innovative. And that's one of the reasons why meditation, if you practice it in Oxford or anywhere, you'll find you'll be able to learn much more quickly, retain that information more easily, and bring it out in exams without making too many mistakes. It's very simple. But that's the sort of thing you, you teach. So as well as the 16 stages of meditation called Anapanasati, there is always another few things which you can add just to make sure it's not going to be boring. So first of all, the Buddha said, if you are going to do your meditation and really be able to train, find a nice quiet place to do it. In the sutta it says, go to you know, a forest, a ranya. But actually the word doesn't mean forest, it means like a wilderness. It can be a mountain, it can be a cave. I love caves. And the reason is because wherever you go in the world, there's always some aircraft flying over you. Or there's the sound of the police sirens. Or there's the sound of somebody having a party. Or there's the sound of fireworks. I don't know what's going on in Oxford, but there's fireworks. We only had fireworks in November the 5th when I used to stay in England. There's fireworks all the time now. I don't know why. Anyway, there must be some reason. But it's very hard to find a quiet place. But one thing I do know, they never have fireworks inside a cave. <laughs> and so because of that, I just love caves. So much so... This is honest, you know this uh, Ayachanda, I live in a cave. The monks made a cave for me. And it's a beautiful place to meditate, to sleep, everything. I do do a lot of work. Part of this coming here is to support Ayachanda. She's now got a nice um, Wihara uh, over in Ifli. But it can still be noisy. It's hard to escape from people. But over in the monastery, which I built over in Perth, they built a cave for me, a double door cave. So when I go inside, it is totally soundproof. And I do that no matter what happens outside. You know, if the monks do something stupid or there's a fight or something, I don't know. Please tell me tomorrow, but not today, because I'm meditating. It gives me some seclusion. And it's also not just quiet. The temperature is constant when you live underground. Not just temperature constant. You can close those doors and there is no light. Except if you put on electric lights. In other words, I don't know what time of the day or night it is in there. It's a wonderful way to live timeless, just secluded. So the first part of Anapanasati, to find a quiet place 
It does not have to be in a forest or on top of a mountain. In the top of the mountain, they used to have in the old days, like um, these uh, stupas, these cairns on top of mountains. Then they would have flags. Now they have restaurants <laughs> on top of mountains. If they don't have restaurants, they have what else do they have? Mobile phone towers. That's what people worship these days. But anyway, that getting a quiet place is very difficult. So that's one thing which you can do. Get windows which are double glazed or triple glazed. Get some, um, what's it called, insulation in the walls of your home. Have one room which is really quiet and make sure you can't take a computer in there, there's no signal. In that way, you have a refuge, a peace and quiet. And then the Buddha said, you go to such a place, a place of quiet and peace. Don't think that you can just do this by willpower. If you say, no, I'm not going to turn on the computer, don't think that oh, I'm not going to listen to any noise. Sometimes that just breaks through. Find a place, a physical place, where you can find some peace and some silence. And when you do that, then you sit comfortably. Now when I say sit comfortably, that's just part of the Buddha's teachings of the middle way. Don't do anything which is going to exhaust and tire you. That's the Atta Gilamata. The Gilamata is like things which tire you. And also, some place which is not indulgent. Now to be able to do this, sometimes people always feel that no pain, no gain in spiritual life. But please remember, the Buddha taught Anapana Sati. He never ever taught Anapena Sati. So Anapena, oh please come in, yeah. Okay. These are some nice guests coming in. And he's got a very advanced kid there, five years of age. Many people go to sleep during the talk. He's so advanced, he's asleep before the talk even starts. It's so another word, sit comfortably. Now when it comes to the posture, this is pre the 16 stages of Anapanasati, of breath meditation. The posture which people sit in, they give far too much attention to what is the correct posture. You don't need to sit on the floor, you can sit on the chair. You don't need to have your feet in full lotus. Half lotus, quarter lotus, no lotus at all. And I say that from experience. On this one crucial occasion, I was suffering from scrub typhus in a third world um, hospital in the monk's ward. I lost all my energy for about three weeks and the fever hadn't abated at all. And just one day, you could kind of get fed up. And I decided, why not meditate? I always thought it was impossible to meditate with a fever, with no energy. But I decided to meditate anyway, just lying in the bed, in fever. Meditated, and to my surprise, we got into a beautiful meditation. So much so, that the body vanished. You couldn't feel that, had a lot of bliss inside. And I never thought that was possible. But one thing I did notice when I came out from that meditation experience, I just checked my posture. If ever you visited somebody who was very, very sick in a hospital bed, they cut their, their legs all over the place, their arms all over the place. Now that posture I've never ever seen in any book. But it worked. And that taught me a very powerful lesson. It doesn't matter how you're sitting or how you're lying down. 
as long as your body is at ease enough that it can vanish and disappear. So anyway, you get into a comfortable position when you're meditating. And after you go into a comfortable position when you're meditating, a most important part of the Anapanasati Sutta is what you have to do before you even start watching the breath. And that is to establish mindfulness as a priority. And for those of you who know your Anapanasati, they say it's, they make sati, mindfulness, they put it parimukhaṃ. And very often that is translated to put it in front of you. That makes absolutely no sense at all to me. In front of what? There's not supposed to be any self in Buddhism. In front of who? So many people think you have to put that in front of your nose or in front of you know, your belly or whatever. It does not mean that. It's an idiom. Parimukhaṃ means to put it in front. Give it priority. So even before you start watching your breathing, please make sure that your mindfulness is strong enough to be able to know the breathing. And having taught meditation many, many years, and having um, meditated, obviously myself, over almost 50 years now, and because of that, you know what that means. You establish mindfulness strong enough that you are able to observe your breathing, to watch your breath without any difficulty. One of the problems I find teaching meditation that people have too much ambition. I used to have that as well. I remember the first WASAC I went to, this was in 1969, and then I was so inspired by the teachings of a, it was a Sri Lankan monk taught that, that Dr. Sadatissa, if you remember him. And he taught that the Buddha sat down and made a determination even though my blood dries up and my bones turn to dust, I will not move from this seat until I attain perfect, ultimate, full enlightenment. And that was really quite an impressive statement. I was only 18, but I was in a hurry. So after the Waysack celebrations, I went to my room and I put a cushion out, sat on it. My maximum meditation, maximum, my personal best was 30 minutes at a time. And I said, it doesn't matter. I made that resolution. I am not going to move from this seat until I attain full enlightenment. Because I was a busy young man. I had many things to do in my life. I want to get enlightenment out of the way so I can you know, go and do other things. So anyway, I sat down there and made the resolution, even though my blood dries up and my bones turn to dust. If the Buddha could do it, why not me? So that's what I did. Sat down there. I got to 40 minutes, a PB, personal best. But by that time, all oh, my legs were exploding in pain. My back was really hurting. And I opened my eyes. I was really disappointed. My blood had not dried up. My bones were still solid. And I was still a very long way from enlightenment. Be careful. That's not the way to practice meditation. If you go for bust, enlightenment or bust, you will always bust. It doesn't depend on willpower, it depends on something much more powerful. Letting go of power. Kindness and awareness. So anyway, after a while you find out how to be aware enough that you can watch your breathing with no trouble at all. The establishing of the mindfulness, that prerequisite the Anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath, is crucial. 
when I first, the first time I went to Malaysia to teach meditation, I was surprised. There the people were complaining about samadhi headache, meditation headache. I couldn't understand that. I would always do meditation to alleviate headaches, not to actually to make them worse. And then when I found out what people were doing, they were putting far too much effort into trying to watch their breath when their mindfulness wasn't sufficient yet. So, the first stage of the meditation is to have enough mindfulness, giving that importance, so you can sit down and be aware, easily. Now that's a difficult thing to ask, the reason is because many of us are so busy, we think too much, plan too much, carry so much weight from the past, that we are essentially sleep deprived. When you go to bed at night, can you sleep easily? You lay down and you go to sleep very quickly, and you wake up refreshed. Why not? Why do you carry some of the, the pain and disappointments of the past and the worries of the future into the bed with you? This is very simple stuff, but if you are chronically tired, you'll find it be very difficult to find the level of relaxation required to be mindful. Many times people force that mindfulness rather than letting it grow. That's one of the reasons why on the uh, live-in retreats, which I teach, I always tell people the first couple of days, if you're tired, sleep. It's quite radical to say that. Because people say, no, come on retreat, I don't have much time. Well, use it wisely, sleep. If any of you want to start a new business to raise a lot of money for yourself, your family, or whatever, find a nice quiet place and just make, not a retreat centre, but a catching up on sleep centre. Where it's nice and quiet, and people can go there, they've got nice beds, they've got no responsibilities or duties, they don't have to attend any event, you have breakfast whenever you want, lunch whenever you want, any time of the day or night, and the main purpose of that is just to relax and sleep and catch up. Honestly, that's something which people are missing in our modern world. They don't know how to relax. So many times, the first few days on the retreats which I teach, people just relax a lot and sleep a lot. And after two or three days, when you're caught up with your sleep, then you can do more awareness, mindfulness practices. Simply being in the present moment. Your mind is energized now. Being in this moment, how do you stay in this moment? Or rather, how do you let go of the past and the future? The only way you can let go of the past or the future is to be kind to it. Don't just try and get rid of it with anger, or just, you know, I shouldn't be thinking about this. If that past comes up, please let it come up. And give it lots of kindness and compassion, which means you're not blaming yourself, you're not blaming anybody. You're not thinking this is a personal uh, mistake which you made. When you're kind to your past, it softens. It's much easier to let go of. And the same with your future. Be kind to it. I don't know what's going to happen, but when you're kind to the future, it gives yourself and others and the future the benefit of the doubt. It's much easier to be free from it, to let it go. Give the past and future kindness, first of all. And the second, that's what I do. And every time I give a talk, I never plan anything. This one is more planned than others, because I do know those 16 stages. And I do try to 
to, to keep to the schedule or keep to the title, even though sometimes I fail miserably. But I don't mind failing miserably. What's wrong with failing miserably? I always thought that if I give a bad talk or tell bad jokes, then people would actually never invite me back again. And then I could have a nice, free, easy life. It doesn't work the way I planned. That's why I often realize that if you don't plan anything, then things go wrong. If you do plan things, they go wrong anyway. So I prefer having a nice peaceful mind before they go wrong. <laughs> anyway, we plan too much, you all know that. So when I learn just how to be kind to the future, you can always adapt, see what happens, and see what needs to be done. Yeah, I'm going way over time. So anyhow, <laughs> I was going to tell the the good, bad, who knows story. How many people know that story? One, two, three, only three, oh, four or five. Okay, here we go then. It doesn't matter, going over time. This is why we worry so much about the future. And this is a story a long time ago when there was a king. And this king liked to go hunting. And one day when he was going hunting with his entourage, he scratched his finger. When he scratched his finger, there's a doctor with him, and he said, look at this finger, there's blood coming out. And the doctor said, oh, that's okay, I'll just put a little band-aid on it. And after putting the band-aid on the wound, the king asked the doctor, is it going to be okay? You know what the doctor said? Good, bad, who knows? But anyway, the king was more interested in the hunt than about his finger, so he carried on hunting. When he got back to the palace afterwards, the finger was inflamed, it was all red. And so he called the doctor again, you have to look after my finger much better, look, it's all inflamed. So the doctor said, oh yes. So he, he cleaned up the wound, he put some ointment on it and put a proper bandage on it. And then the king asked again, is my finger going to be okay? And the doctor said, hmm, good, bad, who knows? He's very wise, that doctor. <laughs> but the king didn't like it, because a few days later, his finger was actually went black. And the doctor said, oh my goodness, he's really got um, gangrenous or something. So he said, I'll have to amputate it. And the king was not happy. But the doctor uh, cut off the finger, and the king was very upset. And he said, all this good, bad, who knows business, and now look, I've got no finger anymore you stupid doctor. And because he was a king, he put the doctor in jail personally. He threw him into the jail and said, doctor, stupid doctor, what do you think about that now, being in jail? You know what the doctor said? Being in jail? Good? Bad? Who knows? He said, that's a crazy doctor. But anyway, after a few weeks, the wound was healed. So the, doctor, the king went out hunting again. And as he was going hunting, you know, he was running after, or rather chasing on a very fast horse over one of these, an after one of these animals. He was chasing so fast, he had the fastest horse because he was the king. And he got separated from all his other entourage. He was in the forest, in a deep part of the forest, alone. And so he didn't know where to go, he was lost. And as he was lost in the forest, he got captured by this indigenous tribe. It was one of their holy days. And this indigenous tribe would always do a sacrifice on their holy day. And now they had this amazing sacrifice, no less a human being than a king. So they're really excited. They tied up the king and took him to the ceremonial place of sacrifice. They tied him to a tree, and after tying them to the tree, the priest came out with his sharp knives, and the drummers started drumming. And 
And that's indigenous for something or other, I don't know. <laughs> and then the head priest took out the ceremonial knife, was just about to cut the throats of the king as a sacrifice to their gods. And then just at the last moment, somebody noticed, hey, that man has only got nine fingers. He's imperfect. You can't give an imperfect sacrifice to your gods and think it's going to be good. No more than you will give imperfect food to Venerable Chanda or any of the other monks and nuns in this hall. Otherwise, that's bad karma, isn't it? Give imperfect food. <laughs> Hope you don't, anyway. So anyway, they had no choice but to let the king go. So they untied him, and they were kind. So they took him close enough to the human settlement, he could find his own way back from there. And so when he got into the palace, the first thing he did was to apologize to the doctor. His eyes thought that losing a finger was really bad fortune. He always said, good, bad, who knows? But look, if I had those ten fingers, I'd be dead. So I apologize to you, doctor. I never realized the powerful wisdom in good, bad, who knows? So I'm going to let you out of jail now, and I'm sorry for putting you in jail. And the doctor replied, sorry for putting me in jail? It was good that I was in jail. If you hadn't locked me in jail, I would have been on that hunt with you. I'd have been captured, and I've got ten fingers. <laughs> okay. You get the meaning of that story. Sometimes what's going to happen in the future? Who knows how it's going to work out? So when anybody decides to get married, sometimes I say, is it good getting married? Good? Bad? Who knows? Brexit? <laughs> good, bad, who knows? <laughs> okay, I won't go there. <laughs> But anyway, when we just you know, look at the future with a sense of happiness and kindness, it doesn't bother us so much. So we can then let it go. Now just imagine that when you are content in this present moment, how much less do you need to think? How much business have you got left to do? A lot of time we think we have to think about the future. We have to remember about the past. Instead, we've been carrying that heavy glasses of past and future for far too long. Put it down and have some space. Have some rest. Then in that present moment it's much easier to be mindful. The practice of mindfulness is not complete yet. Learn to be silent. You don't need to give things names. The best story is that of Lao Tzu. When he was uh, living uh, in China, that he would take one of his disciples on a walk every evening. But they had to keep quiet. There's a golden rule, you're not allowed to talk in the presence of the Master. But then this one young student was with him for the first time. When they were walking, they came to a ridge in the mountains at sunset. It was a glorious sunset. So beautiful, the student said, Wow, what a beautiful sunset. He broke the rule. And the master Lao Tzu turned around, silently walked back to the, the, the monastery, and then he said, only when he was back, that student can never go on a walk with me ever again. He broke the rule. And when the student's friend said, why it's such a punishment? It was only a couple of words, what's wrong with that? And that's when Lao Tzu replied. When he said, 
What a beautiful sunset. He was not watching the sunset anymore. He was watching the words. When I first heard that, it really hit me. There's a lot of difference between watching descriptions and watching the thing in itself. If you want to see a sunset, watch it silently. Then you see so much more. Even in a place like Oxford, when you're actually investigating something, you investigate it in silence. Don't say anything, don't think anything. Because in that silence, you will see so much more. And as a monk, I love those moments of silence. When you're meditating, you get so silent, you look at the floor. Have you noticed how beautiful this floor is? Just wooden floors. There's no two pieces. If you can't see the floor because you're sitting in front of another seat, have a look at the back of the seat. After a while, you can see beautiful patterns in that seat. Simply because your awareness has grown and you're seeing not what you think is there, what is actually there. Life becomes far more beautiful when you're silent. After meditation, I remember this one experience of going for breakfast and that day they had baked beans from a can. When I put that first baked bean in my mouth, no exaggeration, that was the most delicious piece of breakfast I've ever eaten. It had so many different flavours of you know, the tomato sauce, a bit sweet, a bit sour, a bit of salt. And it was so full, it was like a taste explosion in my mouth. And that's just a baked bean from a can. But when you're very mindful, you pick up so much of the senses there. So anyway, that when you are silent, you can feel and see and know much more. And then, with that degree of meditation, mindfulness, then when you start your meditation, the breath is not easy to see, it just comes to you. You relax your body, the mindfulness is strong, what will you experience? The only thing left moving is the breath, going in and out. That's one of the reasons why the breath meditation, it became the most popular form of meditation taught by the Buddha. It naturally occurs. And I'll be honest with you, I never go looking for the breath when I meditate. I just make that mindfulness strong, relax my body, then the mindfulness comes to me. When it comes to me, it's so easy to watch. Because I've prepared the ground for that mindfulness, for that breath rather. That early part of meditation is the most important. Without that establishing mindfulness as a priority, and knowing what mindfulness actually is, you find you struggle. You just feel you can't do it because you haven't prepared your mind enough. And so once it is prepared, the mindfulness is easy to watch. Oh yeah, the breath is easy to watch. You just see it coming and going out. Now on those instructions from the Buddha to watch the long breath, the short breath, that was a problem when I started meditating because Sometimes my breathing wasn't long, wasn't short, it was kind of in between. What is a long breath? What is a short breath? That didn't really matter. What really mattered was I could see the breath, it was long, short or middle, just to know it was enough. This is where sometimes people use these mantras with the breath. You know, like breathing in. Uh, in Thailand, you used to use buddho. Breathing in, bud, breathing out, toe. 
I never worked when I went to Australia because people didn't have the feeling for what the Buddha meant. So I asked them first of all, as you're breathing in, to think the word shut, as you're breathing out, up. Shut up. Shut. <laughs> and that's what they did what you're doing, they laughed. So instead, if you're going to use a mantra, use something which is a bit more useful for you. If you're suffering from something like cancer, breathe in health. Breathe out, let go. I always like saying breathe out with let go, because that is like the breath going out. Things are leaving you. So anyway, those are just the first two stages of Anapanasati. Seeing if you can make the breath a little bit more interesting for you. But that's as far as you go. Because soon the third stage of Anapanasati, and I mean say these are stages, because they happen automatically, naturally. You start to be aware of the whole of the breath. Now I know that for many of you who have listened to teachings on breath meditation, sometimes the word actually is sabakaya, tati sangwedi. And that word does mean, the kaya means the whole of, no, sabha means all. Kaya also means body, physical body. But it makes absolutely no sense to believe or to interpret that this means you're feeling the whole of your body when you're doing breath meditation. Not trying to feel your toes or your knees or your bottom. Those are the things which are supposed to be fading away. It's the whole of the breath. I can see my finger. It's going from your left all the way to the right. From the right all the way to the left. You see all parts of that breath. You don't miss one part of it at all. It's no longer in, out. It's the whole process fills your awareness. And then the next stage is to stabilize that kaya sankara. And I mentioned that, I'm being specific now because I've been telling stories before. The kaya sankara is the bodily formation, the physical feeling of the breath. See the whole of it and calm it down. And what happens next, the fifth stage of the meditation, it gets into the important stuff now, that you develop awareness of the breath with joy and happiness, with pity and sukha. If you want to know what those things are, you mention the uh, sixth, sorry, the seventh stage, which is uh, stabilizing that, that, that chitta sankara. When I saw that, you knew exactly what it meant. This is actually the joy and the happiness which you are seeing is coming from the mind. It's not inherent to the breath. In the same way, the delicious taste of that baked bean that was coming from the mind, enhancing that sight, that taste. It wasn't in the baked bean itself. What you're actually doing there with your breathing, you will notice how how the mind knows the breath rather than how the body feels the breath. It's a different sense store, different uh, way of experiencing. You're last starting to use your mind. So you notice that Kaya Sankara and again you stabilize that Kaya Sankara as number eight. So that Chitta Sankara. This is the eighth stage of Anapanasati. And the way you experience that in practice is as you're breathing in and breathing out, you see the full breath and you stabilize it, then you find that you have joy and happiness with the breathing. The breath becomes delightful. And the amount of delight it comes is not a small amount of happiness. It's delightful enough, you do not lose your attention on the breathing. In fact, you can meditate for long periods, because it's joyful, it's fun, it satisfies the mind. 
and that is what overcomes the restlessness. Why do people get restless when all they need to do is to watch the breath go in and out? Simple thing to do. If it doesn't satisfy you with some joy and happiness, you find the mind will wander. When it's delightful, just watching the breath go in and go out, of course you don't want to do anything else. And it happens very often. Of course it happened to me many times. Sometimes you're having such a wonderful time meditating, you miss your lunch. And if you miss your lunch, you can't have any afternoon tea or snacks in the evening. As Buddhist monks, we don't eat afternoon until the following morning. So you know exactly what you're up for. You're going to be hungry, but watching the, the breath becomes so much more delightful. You, can't, you don't worry about eating. You're enjoying yourself. And this is where you see some people sitting down meditating, and they don't want to come out. They have a choice. The joy and happiness of meditation is far more delightful than eating. And then, that, those are the fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth stages of Anapanasati. Then the ninth stage of Anapanasati is experiencing the citta, the mind. And this, the Buddha also compared these stages of meditation to the Satipatthana. He said this is starting the training of the third Satipatthana, the, the awareness, the mindfulness of this thing which we call the mind, the sixth sense. He said at this stage you are aware of the jitta. Now I know many people sometimes argue does a mind actually exist? Yes, of course it does. And this is how you get to know it. It becomes personal experience rather than just theories or beliefs. Because at this stage of the meditation, the joyful breath becomes so refined. The joy is what dominates. And often these beautiful what we call nimittas arise. These are the beautiful lights in the mind. This is how the Buddha taught. If you want to ever check this, it's in the Majjhimilikai 128, the Upakalesa Sutta. And there the Buddha was talking about all the problems with maintaining those beautiful nimittas. And those beautiful lights which come up in the mind. Beautiful lights, if you are a visual person, and I'm just going to use that, those visual objects first of all. Beautiful lights in the mind. You've got your eyes closed and either see the screens or fireworks or complicated limiters. And you know that these qualify as uh, seeing your jitter because the five senses have, have disappeared enough, either totally disappeared or the sense of feelings in the body are almost not there. Sounds are very distant. What you're actually seeing, your eyes are, are closed. The five senses have stopped, or almost stopped, and the energy of your mind is very strong. And you usually experience this by seeing either a complicated image, which eventually becomes a very simple image, and very beautiful, with the sense that whatever you see, if it's a colour, it's not like a colour from the real world. If it's a yellow, it's so often described by people, the best way you can describe it is more yellow than yellow, more white than white. You don't see whites that clean and powerful in the real world with your eyes open. This is a mental image that's powerful, it's um, joyful, and as you see these things, so often people get scared. Powerful images, and we're afraid of power. The other thing we're afraid of is are like uncontrollable. You have to disappear for them to stabilize and be peaceful and get stronger. 
So at last you're beginning to see that you can't do these things. You relax, let go, and they happen. And many people experience this. This is one of the reasons why I teach like this. Too often that people have come to me and they, they're not even Buddhists. They haven't got any clue about meditation. And they say they have these experiences. One of these people who came up was uh, in, while I was teaching in Penang. And she was a Malaysian. And she had this amazing experience. And uh, she was, went to see psychologists and psychiatrists and no one could tell her exactly what it was. And she was so worried and anxious about that. She thought she had some possession or some anxiety. She didn't know what it was. But once she explained what had gone on with extra details, she said, yes, exactly, that's what it was. And she left a very happy lady. So these things do happen to many people. And so in the 16 stages of Anapanasati, having experienced that limit when it comes up, then the Buddha said, Abhi Pamojayang Jitang, which means give it more joy. More, I call it like brightening up the limiter, giving it more energy so those lights become even stronger and more stable. And the next stage was Samadahang Jitang, which means keeping that limiter still, stabilizing it. Those two always work together. When you stabilize them, it, keep it still, it does eventually get brighter. And one, oops, one problem with <laughs> those limiters is that sometimes people see beautiful lights in their mind, but they're like stained or grubby. If you do see a grubby stained limiter, that's usually because some of your sealer your virtue is not good. When I said that the first time, that a couple of these, it was a Malaysian disciple, came up to me and said, Ajahn Brahm, I saw a nimitta, but it was like a cloth which hadn't been washed for weeks. It had all stains on it. And I asked him what he'd been doing. He said, yes, I know. I haven't been keeping my precepts. But I also told him the loophole. I'm very good at loopholes. The loophole is, as you're seeing a beautiful light in your mind, don't focus on the negative, dirty parts. Between those dirty parts, you'll see pure parts, clean parts, bright parts. Zoom in on them. And as you zoom in on them, they will just fill up your mind and push the other ones off the radar, as they say. And soon your nimitta will become so beautiful and bright, and bright. And as it comes beautiful and bright, it gives you so much happiness and joy. And afterwards, you can enter that um, nimitta. And that fulfills the 12th stage of Anapanasati. Vimochayam Jitang freeing the mind, and that is an idiom for freeing the mind from the five senses. This is where the five senses just go so far away from you. You've entered the jhana. And those jhana realms, if it's a real jhana, you cannot hear sounds, you cannot feel the body, you cannot even think. Beautiful stages of stillness. And to give you a quick understanding of how these things happen, when, well, so often people ask me, Ajahn Brahm, I talk a lot about jhanas, write books about jhanas, well known as a teacher of these jhanas. I don't want to translate that term because I've never seen a decent translation ever. These are jhanas, five senses vanish a lot of bliss in the mind. They asked me, Ajahn Brahm, can you, are you just teaching from experience? Can you achieve those jhanas? And I said many times to many people, Ajahn Brahm cannot 
enter a jhana. I cannot do it. So am I a hypocrite? I said that to get your attention. Ajahn Brahm has to disappear first. My sense of self, especially that part of me which is a doer, my will, my choice, my wanting, that has to disappear. That which you usually identify as who you are, vanishes. And then the door to jhanas are fully open for you. That's where they're weird states, because your sense of self is not there. It's one of the reasons why that sometimes some of the mystics in the Christian tradition, I'm talking about Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, they seem, I'm not sure, but seem to have attained that same first jhana. And often they call it union with God. They're just not there, blissed out. But their sense of self and will, gone. They call it surrender. So because of that, sometimes you can realize how powerful these things are. And if you want to attain these things, you can't. When you vanish and disappear and become so still, then they happen almost automatically. It's not only needing that sense of temporary letting go of your sense of self, to enter these things. But they also teach you just the uh, irrationality of believing in the self. And these are beautiful states of mind. And after you emerge from these things, the last four stages of Anapanasati are understanding impermanent anicca. I'm not going to call it impermanence anymore. That's just people think that anicca means impermanence. It means something much different than that. It means irregularity, something which has always been there, changing, disappearing, vanishing. And the simile behind that, which I promised I would say, is about the Kohlkopper. That's German for tadpole. A tadpole born in, did I pronounce it correctly? Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're very kind. A tadpole born in the water, lived all its life in the water, cannot understand what water is. Doesn't matter how much it studies what water is. You lived in the water, existed in the water, you don't know anything else about water, you can't understand it. Like a fish can't understand water. The difference between a fish and a tadpole is one day the tadpole grows arms and legs, becomes a frog. Once it becomes a frog, it can jump out of the water. Imagine the first time a little tadpole, now a frog, jumps out of the water. It's totally different than anything it's experienced before. Like entering these deep meditations called the jhanas. Totally different than anything you've experienced before. Something is missing. With the frog, it's water. That's what anicca means. Something which was always there, constant, reliable, has now disappeared and gone. And from that you can see how that happens. Some things fade away and then they cease. Once water is no longer there, they have an opportunity to understand what water is. Once your body and five senses have vanished, when you first enter that jhana, and with it, one of the main things which vanishes in the first part of these meditations is the will, choice. Do you think that you decided to come here this evening? Or was it conditioned by some other reasons? We assume we chose to come here. But when you look more deeply, this was a cause and effect process 
which made you come here. Understanding what your will is. How, do you, how can you ever know what your will actually is until it disappears? Once it does vanish, like the frog now knows what water was. When you get into a first or especially a second jhana, you will know what will is. This is where the insights come from. Things which you thought was always there, no longer there. They faded away, they ceased. So no longer will you think they're so important you have to attach to. You can let them go. The Patti Nisiga, the 16th stage of Anapanasati. I do really apologize for going on too long. But nevertheless, I've done, oh, it's not that long. I've six minutes over time. So, now we can have comments, questions, or complaints. Okay? Comments, questions, or complaints? Yes? This is a bit personal, but I've watched you since I was 15 and uh, I was in a really bad way when I was in the hospital and there's parts of my mind that I get to a certain point, maybe about stage 6 every single time. And then I don't know if it's Mara, and then I don't know if it's maybe Adam Charles saying the light wants to learn too much, I've gone too far. Do you know what I mean? You need to experience it. But I just. My mind sort of tortures me in that stage slightly. Like my body will go and I'll feel so happy and yes, fine, come on. Yeah. But then I sort of maybe think, am I obtaining it? Am I wanting it too much? But my mind sort of attacks me as soon as I go and observe me. I, I find that stage quite difficult. Yeah, it can be quite emotional at times. And almost sometimes when it gets too much, I want to run away from it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I just wonder if you had anything that I can that thanks was the most important part of your question but one thing you can try is when you do your meditation and you're getting close to those deep meditations where you know joy and happiness come with the breath when you start the meditation, give yourself what we call the programming of mindfulness. Just tell yourself, if that happiness and joy of the meditation arise, I will enjoy it and value it, I will let it be, in your own words. And then that kind of breaks those habits, those old habits of being afraid of those states. Honestly, you've been nothing at all to be afraid of. You know, and I'll give money back everything guarantee. Because <laughs> I know those stages and they're beautiful, they're blissful. And also just, they strengthen your mind. If you went into hospital because of something, that was your brain, not your mind. The two are totally different. The brain has somehow just got some, uh, what do you call it, like bad connections. But your mind is much more powerful than that. So you're actually getting in contact with your mind. And that's going to be a wonderful, safe place to be. Okay, thank you. I like that difference between the mind and the brain. Is there any doctors here? Do you any? Okay. There's something which, you know, now there's a term for it, terminal lucidity. Terminal lucidity means sometimes people are in coma, or sometimes they've had very bad dementia, or sometimes they've had brain cancer, say. There's one case which I remember reading some years ago, a gentleman had uh, cancer in his brain, it was just eating away his brain or colonizing the brain cells. You could see it happening. And the prognosis, you know, was very easy to know. They would go into a coma. The parts of the brain which were still functioning were looking after the main parts of keeping the body alive. 
and then eventually they wouldn't be able to do that anymore and you would die. So the, the neurosur a neurosurgeon, whatever he was, uh, knew pretty much to the hour when this guy was going to die. You could see the progress. So all the family were around for the last you know, few moments. And then he opened his eyes, recognizing all the members of his family, talking to them. And the doctor said, this can't be happening. But it was. That was an extreme case. One of the doctors I know in Perth, when I asked him if anything like this had ever happened to you, he said yes. He was an intern at the hospital. One of his patients went into the, the process of dying, which is a process. And once it starts, you can know this is happening. And so he went to his bedside, rushed there, but the guy was too far gone to talk with. And so that he remembered the instructions. If I get to that dying process, here are my relations. Please call them and get to come to the bedside. And that's what he did. He started ringing this list of close relations. And they said, oh, we're coming straight away. We're coming straight away. When they got to this guy's daughter, you know, he was ringing the daughter, your father's dying, please come as soon as possible. And then the father opened his eyes. He said, please tell my daughter how much I love her. And those were his last words before he passed away. He should not have been able to say that. At that stage, his brain was just too far gone. And it happens, the lucidity just before you pass away. What is actually happening there if your brain is shot, it's done. But your mind takes over. It gives you that lucidity. The beautiful stories, I think, anyway. Any other comments or questions? Where? Don't say, oh, there you are, thank you. So, <laughs> is the main reason for meditation to get away from suffering, and also to see life in a different way. The main reason for meditation is to become fully enlightened. It's part of the Eightfold Path, and the most important part of the Eightfold Path. That's why it's number eight. And also, it is one of the reasons why that you do this for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes people do it to cure cancers. Sometimes people do it because they're too stressed out. So this evening, the topic was the 16 stages, so it was a whole lot. You might start doing meditation just because it's fun, that's how I started. But then it gets so deep, it starts to give you experiences which you never expected before. So your whole body vanishing. And then you can actually experience what this mind is. And I mentioned this in a talk, I think, where was it? Somebody, oh, that's right, at, um, at Kagyu Temple, it was yesterday, wasn't it? Somebody asked me, why did I become a, a monk? Or oh, I said, why did I start really getting into meditation? Same thing, really. And that was that experience. I'm totally honest about it. Some people criticised me for this because they expected me to be just this really perfect young man as a, almost like ordained, not born to be a monk. But I was messing around like everybody else when I was young. I had a girlfriend, we had a very sexual relationship, sleeping with her. And then there was a retreat on at Cambridge. And so I went on that retreat. And after a few days I had this beautiful meditation, which was much better than sex. And my first reaction, this was honest, why didn't anybody tell me about this before? <laughs> that was the end of the relationship. But it also meant that, you know, that my path into monkhood was almost like assured. Deep meditations. And I wanted to find out why. And it's also those deep meditations, they result afterwards when you emerge from those meditations. You know, your five hindrances 
disappear for a long period of time. You're very bright, you don't want anything, you're not afraid, no ill will. The mind is still, it doesn't, no restlessness, no sloth and torpor. Sometimes you can't sleep, you don't want to sleep, you're energized. Your mind is pure, it doesn't waste energy. And you don't have any doubt, which is a strange thing, that idea of what is doubt? You'll never know what doubt is until it disappears. No more than the, the frog knows what water is until it gets out of the lake. That's one of the most important parts of Buddhism, doubt. But also you have no ill will, no sort of discontent, no arity, and no weariness, no tandy, you're energized. So the post meditations are just gorgeous states, but they're also states where you have mental power to penetrate into the truth of things. And this is not just the spiritual truths, even just one of the Nobel Prize winners at Cambridge, Josephson, he got his Nobel Prize about quantum tunneling after meditating. He did the TM type of meditation. But that made his mind so powerful that he could get a Nobel Prize out of that. This is what the meditation does. And that's one of the reasons why when you start tasting these fruits of meditation, you know, that just really gets you into it big time. And why not? Does that sort of answer the question? Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Complaints? Yeah, thank you. Can I ask you about gratitude? Yeah. Or appreciation. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. that's a good thing, right? To do what you do. It's something that's very good. But it, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, then that is good, bad, who knows? You, oh, yeah. You've decided it's good. And you've decided it's about me. I think that's good. And yeah. therefore, I appreciate it and I'm grateful for it. And I, I don't quite get the, the difference between the two of that makes sense. Like, I'm always thinking, I've got to think this is great. Yeah. But actually, you shouldn't yeah. be thinking whether it's good or bad. I yeah. should just be accepting it. Accepting it, but then as you accept it, you feel it for yourself. So you get to know its qualities. And if you, know, you have got a peaceful mind, you're not seeing what you want to see. You're not seeing what you're in denial of seeing. The mind is clear. There are some things which are good. There are some things which are bad. Like the demeaning another being just because they look a bit different than you. Discriminating against a person because the gender identity is a bit sort of challenging for you. Just um, the way we react, we overreact to things like death and sickness. Because of that overreaction, I would say that that's certainly unhelpful, bad, if you like. And so that's why you spend a lot of time teaching, to try and encourage good things. But gratitude is something, you know, totally different, I would think, than good and bad. The gratitude is to thank you for being able to teach me. Be grateful for all the times you made mistakes. That's how we learn. Be grateful for other people who have hurt you. That teaches you compassion. Even uh, yesterday when people said that they had been traumatized by some very bad abuse in the past. How do we deal with that? And they mentioned the way of gratitude. How can you be grateful to someone who's treated you so incredibly badly? And the way that gratitude works is you see the, how you can make use of that pain and that situation. It's the old making mangoes out of dog shit simile you've heard earlier. So at first, you know, when you fall into the pit of dog shit, you know, that's disgusting. Why did someone throw me in there? 
then you realize that you take that home when you climb out and then you, your mangoes are sweeter than anybody else's. You grow in wisdom and compassion. It's the only thing you can do. And that's the gratitude. After a while, a good example of that is the mosquitoes over in northeast Thailand. I was telling a Venerable Chanda, and you know, I haven't exaggerated this over these years, you know, we were starting this forest monastery in northeast Thailand. Ajahn Chah would come every evening and we'd sit meditation for an hour or two at mosquito feeding time, six to eight o'clock p.m. And right now you can see that I'm wearing the robe over both shoulders. Over in Thailand the head was really bald, bare shoulder, bare arm. There were so many more seats at the dining table for the mosquitoes. And this was the first time they had Western food. So honestly, with another monk, it's very hard to bear. When you, often you'd open your eyes and you want to run away. But your teacher was there, Ajahn Chah, and I was embarrassed to run away. There's nowhere to run to anyway. So you count the mosquitoes. That was a little game, who, who could count the most. And it got to about 60 or 70 all at once. And that was really hard to bear. But then when you complain to Ajahn Chah, he would actually say, from now on, look at those mosquitoes as your teacher. Ajahn Mosquito. <laughs> and you may laugh because you know, there's no mosquitoes in Oxford this weather. Well, at that time, I didn't like that piece of advice at all. But then, I used that experience with unbearable irritation to actually make sure that when I sat down to meditate, I didn't mess around. I did all those stages pretty quickly. Going into deep meditation till my body vanished. And when it did, you had no feeling of the mosquitoes biting your arm or your head. And you were very peaceful and very blissed out. And so Ajahn Chah was right. Say thank you, Ajahn Mosquito. I didn't like you, but you certainly taught me how to meditate. And I use those experiences a lot. Anything which is difficult, you can learn so much from. If you can run away, run away like I would run away, but I couldn't. So you learn from them. And so now I do have gratitude for those mosquitoes. Any other question? Yeah. Can I ask one about parenting? What do you think from a Buddhist perspective the most important Buddhist teaching is for us to teach our children? Okay. This is an old answer, but it's a very powerful one. Please encourage your children to be honest. And number two, to ask questions. When you, you get really fed up, Daddy, why? Daddy, why? Daddy, why? Please encourage their questioning, because that would encourage them always to sometimes doubt established truth. And their honesty would mean they will not stop at an answer which they find very dubious. So that creates that inner strength. And when they go to temples or go to churches or go wherever, they will always be encouraged to ask those questions. And if they don't think it sounds right, they'll ask another question. So they will not be easily fooled in life. Simple, but powerful. Oh, yes. Hello, Jean I want to say thank you so much for coming here and uh, just for all your teachings. Uh, and I would like to ask about the web. Uh, do you think we are intended all our circumstances from previous lives? Or can we change something about it? If so, uh, yes, you can change much. You don't know what you inherit. 
you don't know your past karma. So you can't say that this, uh, I'm sorry husband, I can't do any better because this is the result of my past karma. <laughs> so inst instead, yeah, instead what we say is that um, we don't know exactly what our past karma is. So here we are, how can I make it better? You can improve things. Things aren't so deterministic. A good example of that is my birthday is on the 7th of August. And one person once asked, they wanted to give me a birthday present. And a monk doesn't need me anything. So they sort of very innovative. They said, about what time were you born and what place? So I gave him all the details. And this man, he was a lawyer, he was quite wealthy. So he said, I'm going, he never told me what he's going to do, but on my birthday he said, Ajahn Prabhu, there's a special birthday present this year. I've uh, paid a lot of money for this very, very well-known astrologer to give you your horoscope. It cost me a lot of money, this horoscope. Can I read it out to everybody? I said, yeah, what is my horoscope for the next year? From this person who's very, very famous. And he started off and said, for anyone who was born on this day at this place, as I read Acton, uh, actually Park Royal at the time, anyone who's born on this time, this place, this date, that this next 12 months, he read out, will be a wonderful year for romance. <laughs> <laughs> we never got any further. I burst out laughing, everyone else burst out laughing. And I'm still a monk, so he was wrong. <laughs> Things, and people have done experiments with people who have had a psychological assessment, or they've had a horoscope, or sometimes a prediction of their characters. And it's amazing how much you can change those. These are just influences on you, at most. It's how you react to those influences are the most important part of your future. People in jail can afterwards live wonderful lives. People who've, for some reason, lost all their money, they can still do wonderful things with the little they have. People who have other just great tragedies in their life, like you may lose a member of your family, a daughter or a son. What do you do about that? Very bad karma, unfortunate karma. But you see some people have grown so much from that, and that's made of these wonderful people. Sometimes you wouldn't wish those things on them. They've learned so much, they've grown so much. They've made use of the dog poo in life to make beautiful mango orchards which they can share with everybody. Okay. Okay, another couple of questions quickly before we close. Yeah, it's not quarter two yet. It's only 20, 2044. <laughs> yes. I wanted to ask about uh, reacting versus responding to situations. At the beginning of your talk, you uh, mentioned Yes, it is. So, does the circumstance make you feel tired, overburdened, stressed? If it does, then just take five minutes, ten minutes, however long you can, to relax. Many people, I prefer here the um, American terminology. If anybody 
is feeling really stressed out, then tell your boss you go into the rest room and lock the door in there for 10 minutes. And then when your boss says, why did you spend so much time in the toilets? You say that I was constipated. <laughs> Don't tell them the constipation was not sort of in your guts, it was emotional. You're being honest and it actually works. Another last question before we finish off. Nice and last note, attachments to bliss, I seem to recall that the jhanas are one jhana which, uh, which is equanimity, which is not sort of beyond the bliss. Yeah, very quickly, this is in the Pasadika Sutra, in the Dika Nikaya. The Buddha said, if anybody asks you, any monk or teacher, can you get attached to the bliss of meditation? You say, yes, you can. And he said, what happens if you get attached to the bliss of meditation? The result of being attached to the bliss of meditation is you'll become a stream winner, once returner, non-returner or fully enlightened. In other words, it is a kind of attachment, but it is not dangerous. Be attached. I often say this is when I'm in Malaysia or in Thailand. I say, if you're on the back of a motorbike, please stay attached. <laughs> okay. Okay, so thank you for listening. And hopefully that some parts of the, the talk were helpful for you. I usually only give the talk on deep meditations during a retreat time when you've got more time and more opportunity when people can ask questions afterwards. So I hope it worked for you. And I did put in a few jokes and funny stories just to light it up for some time. So thank you all for listening. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Just a quick advertising. Uh, <coughs> just a word for our sponsors. The reason I'm in here again in Oxford is because we have now purchased a wihara. A wihara means a place, like a little monastery temple, over in Ifli. And that's where um, Ayachanda is staying. So the first fully owned bhikkhuni temple, not just in Oxford, in the whole of UK. So now later on, when they write the history of Buddhism, even in England, Oxford will be mentioned. The first, I'm a bit sad it wasn't Cambridge, but then I have to let go. <laughs> but the first place where we can show equity, at least the beginnings of equity, for females. And why on earth has it taken so long? That's how I feel. So now we have a bhikkhuni, fully ordained bhikkhuni, keeping all the precepts. Please look after her. It's not just giving the ordination or getting a temple, it's making sure that she feels happy there, supported by a community. If you see her in Oxford, you know, walking here or walking there, down by the river, please say hello to her. If there's anything we can do to help, because as monks and nuns, we don't have any money at all. We don't carry credit. Uh, well, you've got the Anacampa Bikuni credit card. Can't use, it. Can't use it though. So we don't have our personal stashes of cash. So if you can help in any which way, like somebody helped just paying for the, uh, a taxi for us to come here this evening. We can't sort of pay for that ourselves, we just don't have the funds. We don't have money. We try and rely upon the generosity of our supporters. So this is also a test for each one of you in Oxford or over in other parts of the world you've come from. Can you support a fully ordained bhikkhuni? If you can't, it doesn't work, she'll disappear. Okay. <laughs> Now you go to Perth.
in Australia. Yeah. Oh, we're on the other side of the world. Yeah. And I just want to, on that note, thank everybody who has been supporting because I see many of you here. I didn't recognize your faces when I first, but anyway, I can see quite a few of you friends. <coughs> And it's very lovely to see you again, and also <coughs> to the Sangha and to Venerable yeah. uh, Dhamma Dina and Sarah. It's very nice to have you here tonight, and um, thank you very much for your support because you've all been expressing a lot of welcome and a lot of uh, respect for what we do, and that means a lot. So just to thank everybody already for the support that you've given in order for us to get to this point. And also to welcome you, because although you will be hopefully <laughs> supporting me in ways that only like the lay community can do, that as monastics, of course, our whole life is all to, su to support by sharing the Dhamma. So that's why I organize Ajahn's tours and bring him to teach every year. And that's uh, also what I want to do for people when he's not here as well. And uh, we will be getting a little schedule in the monastery eventually. I'm just, I just moved in literally like two weeks ago. So, and it's been kind of crazy setting things up and then starting with our retreat. We had a, a Zoom retreat that we live streamed from there. So it already has some good energy, but later and um, as soon as possible, we'll be having an opening and uh, yeah, we'll be having regular meditations and sutta classes and that kind of thing from there. So. You're very, very welcome for tea, for meditation, to share lunch, etc. And also to stay as guests. So, um, yeah. But please don't wear her out. A single woman there, single nun. And sometimes people offer food, but they want private consultations as well. And that, just one of you, it's not a problem. But as many of you, you soon get super tired and worn out, burnt out. So please respect the boundaries which monks and nuns set. Because otherwise, now you're all special, but some people are more special than others. <laughs> At least that's how they think. And if you think that's not fair and that bikinis get it good, I also want to open the opportunity for people to ordain. <laughs> so um, that's also a big part of this project, is that uh, you know, ideally we form a, a stable community of other monastics as well. The more we have, the more teachers there are, and everybody can teach something a bit different. You know, Everybody might connect with a different teacher. And I think we need a variety, and so eventually we hope to form a, a, a stable community of people who are monastics but also people who can come and live and for longer periods of time. So I think it's so important to have a place, you know, to have like a central hub for community to gather because yes you can hear the teaching, <coughs> yes you can go to talks but it's like where do we actually get together and form relationships over time? So I think this is really what a, a monastery can be, that simply having a meditation centre or you know, public talk can't really offer. So I do hope it can be lasting and enriching for many people's practice. What are you doing to have a best not for this society at the beginning of the minute? I've been trying to get one for a year and a bit, but would you be interested in helping out that sort of thing? I mean, basically I'm interested in everything amongst the Dhamma. The thing is, being only one person, I have to prioritise the things that um, I, I can do. So, of course, I think it's really important that the a Buddhist uh, society, are you saying at the university, yeah? Yeah, I've noticed that, that there's something missing there. Because every year we're trying to invite many students here, and we say, you know, we've got a place for 30 students, just come, and yeah, but they never come. I was, I was in Tasha style in the first year, you know. Oh, and then, oh, yeah. Yeah. But if, if you know a group of students at the university want to invite me to give a talk or something, then I can do it. Given you know, depending yeah, on my schedule, I can definitely do that. Cool. Great. Yeah, I'm really pro that because the Cambridge University Buddhist Society. <laughs> no, that was the first society which I joined, and I was. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I just was, I was so excited to see there was a Buddhist society. Is that the game of your path in? Yeah, it did, yeah. And so I'm totally, that, when you talk about gratitude, that's who I'm grateful for. Just the, the group of students who could start a Buddhist society. Wow, I didn't know there wasn't one. Yeah, okay. 
Excellent, good, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you.